Good afternoon and welcome to this week's edition of Halftime Talk. We're delighted to be joined once again. Twice a year we try to get this gentleman, Dr. Anas al Haji, Managing Partner, Energy Outlook Advisors. Welcome, Dr. Anas, back to Halftime Talk. Thank you. Good to see you, Sean. Anas, it's Great to have you again at these sort of half yearly conversations uh, and, and particularly in the aftermath of the recent uh, OPEC plus disagreement and then agreement. I'm not sure which of those two you would like to focus on, but I'd certainly welcome your insights to both. In some regards, they seem to arrive at a new quota levels with relative ease, even though there did seem to be a bit of a falling out. Your thoughts? Well, a couple of points. Uh, the way we look at it is, regardless of what information we know from insiders, um, it's either we look at it as politics to oil or oil to politics, which means that either there are some deep political issues that cause the rift between certain countries, and then that uh, transferred to oil, and therefore what we saw at the OPEC meeting was a symptom. It wasn't the cause. Or Oil was the cause that developed to be a political issue. And each Which way do you see it? Correct. Each one has a different uh, outcome in this case. But now we know that we know we already know the outcome. They already uh, agreed uh, to it. And I think the key point to this agreement, I know there were many reports in the media, kind of pessimistic report about what's going on. But we have to pay attention to the following regardless of the increases that's been given to the five countries, including the uh, UAE, the total increase has to be 400,000. In so terms that, of the immediate supply rather than the quotas next year. Correct. So if you look at the extension from April 2022 to December, whatever those five countries are allowed. Right has to total 400 no matter what with, with the whole production of OPEC. So in a sense, there is a catch there. But within that catch, we have really to look at some of the uh, details in this case. I think Russia and Saudi Arabia give themselves this a total of million barrels, not because they want to increase it, they want the optionality. So the, the, the quota increase for Saudi and Russia was 500,000 barrels each then from April next year, whereas for the UAE, it was, I think, 300 and something. Correct, correct, about 350. So the idea here is, it seems that the, the Saudis and the Russians wanted this optionality of, on the 500 each, but at the same time, they want to reserve that space for them so no one else can take it, especially when we talk about Iran, Libya, Venezuela, et cetera. But at the, which means that there is a possibility they may not increase that amount if the demand is weak. Well, if we just take your earliest point uh, and ask whether this was politics to oil or oil brought in the politics, because if it's politics to oil, we may not have a solution yet, because if indeed this standoff with the UAE and Saudi Arabia may be part of a bigger narrative of issues, then those issues, those that politics to oil could come back. What is your own sense? Was it politics to oil or oil to politics? Well, it, it's very hard to determine based on the evidence, but let's focus on the first one. I already tweeted about, tweeted about this, that if it is politics to oil, then while it is easy to resolve, which we already saw, it's been resolved, yeah. it could be explosive at any time. So you are absolutely correct on that on that point. Uh, now we've seen, uh, of course, some issues uh, uh, to prove this point uh, in, in various areas, including what happened in Tunisia last night. Uh, uh, but I don't want to delve into that. Yeah, but, yeah uh, I get you. Here is, There's a lot of tangents to this puzzle. Correct. But the, the other point related to this is some countries within this OPEC plus group have 
already maxed out, and some of them will max out soon. In their production. One of the ironies of this agreement is, even if some countries cheated, or they are going to cheat, the continuous increase in production is going to compensate naturally. Right. Yeah. So we're not going to reach a point where probably the Saudis and the Russians and the Russians, probably the UAE to some extent, they will be the only ones who are able to increase production and that's it. Well, I was sort of caught this year and asked in the sense, what is the biggest surprise of this year? And I used to think ultimately it was the OPEC uh, discipline, the alignment of, towards this agreement that all of them have sort of essentially done what they said they would do and, and the Saudis have kept a very tight ship. But I'm thinking the biggest surprise of 21 so far is not OPEC's discipline, but is the IOCs, the international oil companies, who have maintained their discipline and not spending money on new supply, particularly new shale oil supply. Your thoughts on that and will that discipline continue? Well, uh, in, for me, really the biggest surprise is the willingness of the Saudis to cut uh, extra production. Okay. That, that, I mean, they've done it three times, that was in, in a large amount. Yes. Uh, that was really the biggest surprise because if you look at what happened in March 2020, you look at what happened in 2015, in, in light of this massive increase in production, uh, uh, at that time, you look at this kind of additional cut in production, that was really the, the, the big surprise. In terms of discipline, basically that If was you take that surprise, Anas, just to jump in on that, it would have been a pretty costly uh, surprise. Uh, let's say the Saudis agreed to cut one million barrels a day unilaterally. Uh, if the international energy companies of shale oil had jumped into that space and said, thank you very much for $65, $70 oil. We're now going to pump your million barrels that you have stepped back from. But that didn't happen. Correct. But there are several reasons for that. So to me, that was not a surprise. I'll tell you some of the reasons. Most of the shale companies hedged most of their production, as we talked last time and on the show, since they hedge most of their production, some of them are already getting only 40 to $45 and that's it. And since banks and private equity and others are not spending, they are depending only on cash flow to expand and there is not that much cash flow left to expand. So there is not that much. For uh, the Ixon marbles of the world, we know what happened at their board meeting and what the results of the elections of, of the board members at Exxon, what happened at Chevron, what happened at uh, yes. to Shell in court. So in a sense, they are in the phase of reorganization and regrouping. There is no time right now for to focus on investment to expand capacity. So I think that was kind of a natural development of what's happening on the ground. Most of board uh, most of the boards right now are really busy with ESG and all right. other related issues. So it's not really kind of a discipline as much as just a normal result of what's going on on the ground. Just moving along, Anas, uh, a bit of a surprising outcome over the weekend. The energy and environment ministers from the group of 20 nations, the G20, failed to agree on the wording for a key climate change commitments in their final communique. Your thoughts coming out of this meeting, what have you heard? What insights do you have? Well, strangely enough, if you do a Google search, you'll see that most of the media outlets most of the news agencies basically were talking about failure. And people who read the, those uh, headlines, they think that those ministers fail. It turns out it's a failure, uh, really the failure of the dreams of the media and those who are on the far left, because these things did not materialize in the meeting. But the meeting was a success and they, we had an agreement because we had a communique that they agreed to, and it's published everywhere. We know they agreed to it, and it's like 15 pages in addition to all the other uh, things that came with it. But the idea is, it was a, they, they did agree, and it was a success. However, the success of various countries vary on, in, their, uh, in terms of achieving their objectives. 
We know that some countries in Western Europe basically were too extreme. They wanted to change the Paris Agreement and kind of uh, uh, move the dates forward to achieve carbon neutrality. They were faced with stiff opposition from other countries, let's call them the oil countries and the coal countries. And I think the, uh, the oil producing countries, especially Saudi Arabia achieved a tremendous success in this meeting in various ways. Let me list some of them, for example. Please, yeah. the, first, the first thing is they moved oil from the first line of the battle to the back and coal became at the front. So now China and India basically are at the front fighting for coal while the oil producing countries are in the back. And, and that's a tremendous achievement because for the last 12, 13 years, it was oil, it was Saudi Arabia, it was the Gulf, that they, they, they were hit left and right. But now that was a tremendous success basically to move coal to the front, which is really the issue because renewables replace coal, they don't replace oil in Europe. So hitting oil at first basically does not make sense in this case. So well, Trump gave coal a lot of cover, didn't he, in recent years from that point of view of, 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 of coal not being on the front line as much. Correct. And then we have, of course, President Trump who was defending coal, etc. But now coal became the issue and India and China, Australia, uh, Russia, South Korea basically are standing up for coal. So the oil producing countries are happy to see uh, that uh, uh, development. Uh, for, from the Saudi point of view, as you know, they came up with the idea of the uh, circular uh, carbon economy. Uh, the G20 bought into it. Now it's part of this document. It's mentioned in the documents. There are countries that did not believe in it or they did not sign into it at first. Now they signed into it. And those countries who signed into it earlier in 2020, now they are emphasizing it. So that's a success to uh, Saudi Arabia. The other issues, for example, and this is kind of really kind of funny because uh, the disagreement at the beginning that the media reported happened between uh, India and China on one side and Western Europeans on the other regarding two points. First of all is the Europeans want to shut down the coal power plants and India and China said, hold on just a second. That's like half of my economy. I cannot do that. Yeah. And then they, they, the Europeans- I mean, China's went, building more coal than it's cutting out, right? right? And they wanted kind of a firm date to, to, to achieve this idea that I am not going to have any coal anymore. And one of the changes, if you look at the documents, kind of looks really funny. There is no mention of 2050 anymore. And this document, basically, we, before we used to hear like, by 2050, by 2050, by 2050, no more. Now they are talking by around mid-century. Mm. What that means is it's not less than 2050. And it's not at 2050. It's somewhere after 2050. It could be 60, 70, 80, who knows? That's but quite a significant they difference. They signed into it. And India basically interjected by a statement that they added to the agreement and it sounds kind of like really where things are heading in the future. They said, we want to achieve it by 2030, not 2050. And people say, hold on just a second. What do you mean 2030? I said, yes, we can achieve it by 2030 if you count emissions on per capita basis. Right. <laughs> Perfect. <laughs> Hard to argue with that. 1.4 billion people. Correct. So everyone is playing the game their way. And my fear, and this is why I think that most of the uh, carbon neutrality uh, policies are going to fail, that everyone, every company, every country, every official is going to play their game here. And playing those games basically is going to take us nowhere in terms of achieving uh, uh, carbon uh, neutrality. To give you where, where will that put 
President Biden, uh, you sit in Texas, he has come to office with a very strong commitment to uh, the climate accord, the climate, the Paris Climate Agreement, sort of famously re-signing that, re-attaching the U.S. muscle to that, as well as new energy policy in America. I mean, he has a lot at stake if indeed this journey tends to, turns out to be just window dressing. No, is it, does he have the muscle to compel others? Okay, so uh, yes, it is window dressing. And let me explain this to you in, with numbers. Right. Generally speaking, many countries and many companies committed to a certain date for carbon neutrality. But even the officials and the CEOs will tell you that we don't know how to do it. We don't even know how to define it. Correct. We don't know how to do it. We don't know how to pay for it. And we don't know who is going to pay for it. So that tells you where we are heading. Now, the, the other issue why those policies will fail, because those countries are focusing on the expensive policies that have little impact on carbon or carbon reduction. To give you examples, if, the, uh, if all cars in the EU are switched to electric, all of them, and that electricity comes from wind and solar, that reduces carbon emissions, global carbon emissions by only 2%. That after spending trillions of dollars, if you look at the US, if we convert the whole transportation sector, that cars, trucks, semis, planes, ships, uh, uh, all the equipment and the, in the farms, uh, etc., trains, boats, if we convert the whole transportation system in the US to electric, that will reduce global em carbon emissions by only 4.3%. And that's it. So now where's all the carbon then? Cost. We are spending trillions of dollars only to reduce carbon emissions by less than 10%. So how are we are going to achieve neutrality if the reduction is too small while those countries are bankrupt at that time? The other issue basically is we are seeing now everyone playing the game this way. Companies and countries are looking to say, okay, let me see what I've been doing that is compliant with carbon right. neutrality. What's well, so, already in my, in my box, so to correct. speak. So here is uh, Walmart, for example. Walmart can claim that they've been green for the last 40 years, even before anyone talk about it. Why? Because they have those skylights in the stores. And if you replace that with actual electric lights, then carbon emissions will increase substantially. So they, they can count that part of their plan, although it's been there for 40 years. So tell me, where does Biden come into this? Is he going to be well, under dressing or is he going to be serious? Well, here is Biden issue. Let me mention two actual examples. Yeah. The first one is he was challenged in court and lost on banning the drilling in offshore, uh, sorry, banning drilling in federal uh, and, uh, what, uh, and federal lands uh, and uh, offshore. The other one is if they switch all electric vehicles that are owned by the federal government, which is extremely difficult because it turns out most of the what the government own are really large trucks, not cars. Right. But if they switch all of them, that reduces global oil demand by less than 20,000 barrels a day, which is like this is kind of a small well somewhere on the, on the side of the desert in Saudi Arabia. Only 20,000 20, maximum. And the reduction in CO2 is like 0. 0.000001. So does it, what about his ability to tackle, let's say, coal-fired power generation in the U.S.? Well, for coal-fired, basically, we already know the facts on the ground. The facts on the ground is economics have done massive job on this, regardless of Obama policies, regardless of Biden policies. I used to, when I was working at NGP as chief economist, that was part of our daily work, basically, is to watch the switching and which plans basically are being switched because of the economics. And to prove this point, 
Look at what's been happening just in the last 40 days or so. We have unwinding of switching because gas prices went up, LNG prices went up and around the world, and all of a sudden they reverted back to coal. So that means the switching happened because of economics. It did not happen because of policy. If it happened in, because of policy, we would not have seen the unwinding. It sounds to me like you're not very optimistic about COP26 in Glasgow in November delivering any significant step forward for the climate agenda. Well, one of the successes of the oil and coal producing countries uh, on Friday and Saturday basically is to emphasize the Paris Agreement. Paris Agreement, Paris Agreement. They just emphasize it over and over again. What that means is they literally blocked those European countries that they wanted more than the Paris Agreement. So probably the Paris Agreement is the final thing in, in terms of agreeing to, but what's going to happen on the, on the ground is completely different. If we have just Trump or another Trump in the future, he can cancel that uh, with, with the strike of a pen. There was a lot of optimism coming through the COVID year that the, the sort of transition to net zero, that the Paris, exceeding Paris was on the agenda because COVID had changed the perspective of everybody. You're saying maybe that that is a temporary thing and it will not do so on a sustainable basis. You just opened <laughs> a can of form here. The reason why they did that because those extremists of climate change, they believe that we have to have a centralized government forcing everyone to do certain things. And they saw that governments were very powerful during COVID and they were leading the way and doing all the uh, uh, lockdowns and all that stuff. And they said, huh, that's what we are looking for. And we spending, all the spending. Government. So we can do it because we have a centralized government right now. And in fact, if you go back and look at all those leaders of climate change for the last 25 years, 30 years until now, and you look at their statements, all of them called for a centralized government. That's why some of them love China. They want a centralized government. But I strongly believe that are, the reason why another failure for those policies will come from the fact that the way those guys are going with their policies, there is a contradiction between those policies and free, personal freedom and human rights. And the more extreme they go, the more Trump-like we are going to see in the future. Mm. Because that extremism is going to breed other extremism on the other, uh, on the other side. And they are forgetting that they are really infringing on the freedom of a lot of people by forcing them to do certain things. What about uh, the likes of the European majors? Of course, the American majors have faced a backlash in recent months. We talked about that earlier. European majors have been ahead of the curve, uh, BP most spectacularly. Are you saying, in essence, uh, BP, Mr. Looney, is getting it wrong? There are two things here. First of all, and that's another reason why those policies are going to fail in achieving carbon neutrality. Everyone is focusing on the low hanging fruit. Once the low hanging fr fruit basically are harvested, then it's like, difficult and difficult. And the top of the tree, we will never reach that. The other point is, I look at what Mr. Looney and others basically are doing in a completely different perspective. If you study the history of oil companies for the last 120 years or so, the oil industry has always, always, always controlled or tried to control the competition, always. And sometimes they just lock down the competition and put them aside. Uh, even if you look back at the 70s, for example, when we talked about uh, um, oil shale, not shale oil, oil shale in Colorado and others, immediately they jumped on it and they controlled everything. They bought almost the whole Rockies to do that. Uh, if you look at technologies, they control technologies. I remember in the 90s when I was working on hydrogen and one of the predictions I made uh, uh, in that uh, report was that the oil companies are going to literally jump on the wagon and buy all this technology. And it did not take more than two, three years. They bought it all. 
So the hydrogen technology has been controlled by the oil industry since the 90s. So we- And now they're rolling it out. So I don't think it's a behavior because of climate change as much as just the natural behavior of those companies to control the competition for very long time. And that's what they are doing. And that's dangerous, by the way. I think those who are worried about carbon neutrality should, if they really want a central government, they should limit the involvement of the oil sector in it. And the reason why, because the oil sector is crowding out investment and therefore limiting the investment in solar and wind. So if those guys on the solar and wind side, they are serious, they would limit the investment of the oil companies so they can allow other investments to mm -hmm. come in. So it will be extra. All we are doing here is taking the investment from one source and giving it to the other. Let's and and also, before we wrap up, we're sitting it towards the end of July now, looking for the rest of this year, back to where we started, oil markets, OPEC plus, uh, have come through this recent uh, sort of spat. What's your outlook for the second half of the year? What will you be looking for? Are there still fractures within OPEC plus? Is the market now have a clear picture on where supply is and we really need to just focus on demand? Uh, generally speaking, for those who are interested, they can read my tweets, and that's our pinned tweets on my Twitter account, uh, which is at Anas Al Haji, because they need to read about the sweet spot. Based on my model, the sweet spot now is between uh, um, 60, uh, 68 and 75. Of course, dollars per barrel on. This is a talking point, but if you look at the numbers, they are not really 65. They are like, uh, say, 68. They are like 67 point something. Right. Point. But those numbers are just for talking points. So yeah. 68, 75, a sweet spot. Anything below 68 basically is bitter. Anything above 75 is sour. We might end up with days where we have sweet and sour or bitter and sweet etc. But generally speaking, the objective, it, it is very clear that the objective of OPEC leaders is to stay in the sweet spot. Those who are calling for $100 uh, oil, there are no basis for it. And I've been saying this since the, I said it on your show last time too. There are no basis for $100 now, probably in the future, but not now, not in 2021. Uh, uh, we still have massive spare capacity. We still have surplus in storage and now we've seen uh, china uh, using the spr we've seen china re-regulating the uh, teapot refineries and the flow uh, of oil uh, etc so uh, it seems that we have plenty of oil anyway and so this sweet spot won't market. the sweet spot won't bring back higher cost production like shale or deep offshore uh that's a safe spot for the for the opec plus no basically because one of the definitions of sweet spot is to encourage investment uh because the way it's measured it has like uh, more than 20 20 variables and one of them it has to bring back investment the problem we did not see uh investment back in 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 a massive way simply because of the hedging that I mentioned earlier, right. because of the crisis in the board rooms of the oil majors. Uh, I mean, the Saudi I, oil minister, uh, Prince Abdulaziz, uh, came to or uh, gave a speech to New York hedge fund uh, forum a few, what is it, two months ago now, and he basically identified the lack of investment as a crisis. It is definitely a crisis. That's why I'm predicting an energy crisis, no matter what, because there will be a time when we are uh, you asked me about demand earlier. Yeah. There will be a time we will realize that every single de public public demand estimate uh, basically is low. Uh, all the agencies, the IEA, OPEC, and others, all the banks and uh, uh, um, other consulting houses are underestimating demand simply because if those policies of carbon neutrality are going to fail, then definitely demand is going to be higher. And my estimate, basically, demand is going to be way higher. For what and time only, period? Uh, we are talking about probably uh, 20, 20, 25, 25 to 2030. The difference could be as high as 4 million, the shortage. <clears throat> uh, that's with all the increases and all the uh, ability, basically, to increase production 
in, in some countries with the return of Iran, with the return of Libya, with the full return of uh, Venezuela. But for when, do you, when would you expect us getting back to 2019 demand, 100 million barrels, for example? Well, it depends on that delta, <laughs> on that delta thing that is scaring everyone. Uh, really, if we are going to go back to lockdowns, etc., probably we will not have it uh, until 2023. Uh, if we go the same way we've been going in recent months, we will have it next year. Uh, we are going to go back to this. I think the demand will continue to grow. The forecast of PP and others that we demand already peaked or near peak is absolutely not correct. I think there will be a lot of people with eggs on their faces uh, uh, within a year or two. Well, we'll have to wrap it up there. Peak oil demand is egg on your face, whoever's talking about it. That's a big question for another time and we'll be discussing that I think for the years to come. Dr. Anas Alhaji, Managing Partner of Energy Outlook Advisors, thank you very much for being on Halftime Talk this week. Thank you.